titled it Press Out 18. And uh, we looked at the word press out, and the word press out means to extract everything out of something, to, to squeeze something so that you get maximum. And, and we're saying this, we want to go all the way in 2018, amen? We want to extract everything we can out of this year through God's grace and God's will. The, the word press out also is a term used in weightlifting. And, and if you're doing a deadlift, uh, your lift is not completed until you press out those last few inches and your arm gets to that stiff condition where you are now at the highest point you can. And you've got to hold it there for a couple of seconds, else that lift doesn't count. And so we've been talking about the importance of press out. So turn with me, if you were to Isaiah 43. And this is one of the key scriptures that God has placed on our hearts for this year. It's going to be sort of one of our theme scriptures. And, and God's really been talking to us and encouraging us and building us up, uh, our faith up through this scripture. And we're going to start in verse 18 again. It says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Verse 19, for behold, I will do a new thing. Now it will spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way or a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So verse 18, in in its simplest explanation, is telling you and I that God doesn't want us to get stuck in our past. Look at the person next to you and say, don't get stuck. Now listen, you can learn from your past. You can get experience from your past. You can leverage your past for your future. But what you don't want to do is get stuck in your past. Because if you get stuck there, you will miss out or it will keep you from experiencing the new things God wants to do in your life. Verse 19, in in, in a very simple way, God starts to fill us with hope for the future. Say this, say, my future is bright. My best days are ahead of me. All right? And so God's giving us hope for the way forward. So it's important to remember this morning, it's not where you are that's important. It's where you're heading. Where are you heading this morning? We're pressing into what God wants us. So we looked in the first or the second week of our series, we looked at the way. What is, what is God making a way in the wilderness mean to you and I as believers? And, and we realized this, that Where there is no pathway, where where there seemingly is no direction, God is going to give us direction and provision. But this morning, we want to focus on the rivers. Say rivers. God didn't just say, I'll make a way in the wilderness. He said, I will make rivers in the desert. And we want to look at this phrase this morning. And I want to just start by giving you this interesting fact, that water and our health are so related, and I I think God was very specific by using the word rivers, because water sustains life. Do you know that new research they're doing all over the world in universities? They've come to realize that what they are now calling blue space, which is sea, rivers, lakes, urban water features, have a very positive impact on the well-being of people. There's something tranquil, there's something peaceful that that water will do for people that is good for us. You might know that your body consists of between 55 and 65% of water. So water is vital to your well-being and your health. As a matter of fact, water works in nearly every part of your body so that you stay balanced and well. Look at the person next to you and say, are you balanced this morning? So it's no mistake that God uses the prophet Isaiah specifically to to bring this promise to the nation of Israel and to the church today, that he's going to make rivers in the desert. He was speaking to Israel as a nation at that specific time. He was speaking prophetically of what would come at later times, and he was speaking importantly to you and I as the church today. Please notice something very significant. He he says this, I will make rivers in the desert. Not a river. Say rivers. You know, sometimes we can feel limited and restricted in our own ability, and we are, because we're human. 
But I want you to know, God is not limited this morning. God is not restricted in your life. Can you say amen? As a matter of fact, he doesn't just want to sufficiently supply. He wants to abundantly supply. Say abundantly. Come on, church, say, I received that this morning. Tomorrow may, may feel like a barren prospect. You might feel overwhelmed by what you might have to face tomorrow or this week. But I want you to know when you are living near the fountain of life, it doesn't matter what you're facing because the greater one resides within you and he will make a river or rivers in your desert. You see, we can speak of, of lack and, and we can speak of our, uh, the lack of our spiritual life. But you know what? When we turn to Christ, when we look to Christ, Everything changes. Come on, say it with boldness. Say, my future future. is amazing. And I guess what God was really trying to say to us uh, through this prophecy is that you are equal to the task that is in front of you. We saw it last week. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've been teaching myself this year, I get up every morning, it doesn't matter what I'm facing, it doesn't matter what kind of week I'm looking at, it doesn't matter what task is in front of me, I get up and I say, Larry, you are equal to the task because Jesus is in you and he will give you the strength and the ability and the resource and the creativity and the wisdom to face whatever it is head on with confidence, with power and with victory. In the Amplified Bible, listen to what it says. I can do all things, in brackets, which he has called me to do. Through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything, equal to anything, through him who infuses me with the inner strength and confident peace. Doesn't that sound like press out? God is going to squeeze into you everything you need for this year. It also gives me this thought. As we start to think about rivers, as we start to think about our sufficiency in Christ, God wants to open multiple doors for you. God wants to increase your resources. God wants to open more things to you than he's opened in the past. Can you say amen? He wants to give you multiple opportunities, flows that you've never expected would come. Why? So that his name can be glorified. So his covenant can be established. So that the world will know he is alive. Come on, church. I feel like preaching this morning. So listen, before we go spiritual, which is important, let me take you naturally and just look at an incredible testimony this morning. You know, in in desert regions around the world, do you know that water is referred to as liquid gold? Liquid gold. And Israel, which is in the desert, only uses 45% of their natural water resources. You know why? Because God has created rivers for them in the desert, literally. (laughs) What a testimony. Do you know that Israel's desalination technology is helping the world fight water shortages? Israel has always been a leader in water conservation technology because of its desert location. Think about this. God promises Israel, the nation, that he'll create rivers in the desert. In other words, he'll be their sustenance. But he wasn't just saying that. He was saying a whole lot more. He was saying, literally, I will make Israel a nation that will provide resources for the world. You should be getting a whole lot more excited right now because you are spiritual Israel. Stop saying, oh, well, I live on the south coast. No, you live in the best place because where the resources are least, God will create the most. Woohoo! But today, that necessity has grown into an economic incentive. The country now, Israel, recycles, in addition to desalination, it now recycles 85% of their wastewater. By 2020, they estimate that 50% of the agricultural needs of Israel will be met by that recycled water. 
In addition, there are more than 300 water technology companies specializing in desalination, not just in Israel, but around the world, and they now earn $2 billion a year through desalination in the nation of Israel. Come on. God's word is true. God's word is powerful. And this is what I want to say to you today. Hashtag, if you're going to put this on Twitter, hashtag, it's time to think out of the box. God is not limited where you are this morning. God has incredible things in store for the church. Are you the church this morning? Come on, put up your hand if you're the church. Say amen, I'll take that. God is going to give you creative and witty inventions. God's going to give you concepts. God's going to give you ideas. God is literally going to create rivers in your desert and a way in your wilderness. Let me share this testimony. I've got a friend. um, Well, he's not a friend like I speak to him every day anymore. Uh, I actually tried to look him up on Facebook this week when the Lord reminded uh, me of him. His name is Roger Sanders, and he was my second boss. I'm talking years ago, 30 years ago. He was in our church. He was a businessman, and this is what I want to tell you about him. This is how he started his business. He went to to a business meeting one Saturday morning. He was working for a company. He went to this business meeting, Jerry Savelle was preaching, and Jerry Savelle preached a message about standing up, standing out, and stepping out in faith. And in that service, the Holy Spirit spoke spoke to Roger and said, I want you to step out in faith and start your business. And he was like, but I'm not a businessman, I don't know how I'm going to do this, it doesn't make sense naturally, I'm in a good position, I'm a sales manager, I'm earning lots of money, but the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And on the back of that word, that Saturday morning in a business meeting, just a word, just a promise. He built a medical company that became one of the leading medical companies in that field in the whole of South Africa. And I was a sales rep in that company. And his testimony is still going today. Not only was he a businessman in our church that I grew up in, but he funded a lot of the projects. He went on later on when he left that church and moved on. He actually bought ground and he alone built another church for another pastor. Rivers in the desert. Look at the person next to you. Say, you're next. Proverbs 18 verse 12 says this. Our wisdom dwell with prudence. And I find out, say find out. I found out knowledge of witty inventions. Come on, that's a promise for someone this morning. Now go study that in the Hebrew. It's actually very interesting. When when you go study this knowledge of witty inventions, it actually has a two-fold meaning. The first-fold meaning, if you look in the Hebrew, it means the ability to find out evil intentions. So so the first part of the verse is, is saying this, that as you serve God, as you put God first, as you find knowledge, as you put Christ first, as God starts to make rivers in your desert, you'll have a discernment in your life that will be able to find out those who have evil intentions for you, for your business, for your family, for your children, for your church. That's the one meaning. The other meaning is this, is that God will give you a creative imagination, expanding knowledge, innovative solutions, inventive genius, and the application of the gifts that God has placed in you, which will literally launch you to another level in your business, in your life, and in your resources. So I'll take that promise. All right, so that's the natural Let's move to the spiritual because that's where things start. So again, let me remind you, remember we were in Isaiah 43 and God uses the prophet Isaiah and he speaks this word over the nation of Israel to give them hope, to to build their faith, to encourage them in the difficult situation that they were facing and that they found their lives. But it's also a prophetic word because we fast forward nearly 700 years and we looked at this in part two and how many know Jesus steps onto the scene and what's the first thing Jesus says? I am the way, the truth and the life. And so we learned that week that that the way God creates in the wilderness is Jesus. But think about this. The prophet Isaiah also says, I will make rivers in the desert. Fast forward 700 years, look what Jesus 
says in John 7, verse 38 and 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. Come on, you say it. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. (laughs) Let's read on. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit of God, whom those believing him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So in the New Testament, who is the rivers of living water? No, it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the way, the Holy Spirit are the rivers of living water in your life. And Jesus said this, he said that river of living water will flow out of your life and it will spring up into life for everyone. Jesus says, I'm away in your wilderness, but the Holy Spirit will be your rivers in your desert. In other words, listen, as you and I learn to be sensitive and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives, guess where he's going to lead you to? The rivers of living water, the flow, the increase, the growth. How's your marriage going to get better when you listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit? How are you going to bring up your children, parent them, by listening to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? How's your business going to go to the next level? Listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Listen to John 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. But the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Notice something significant. I don't want to get into this this morning because not really the direction specifically we're going. But notice the flesh profits nothing. In other words, you cannot understand spiritual things with your natural mind. You've got to step out of your natural mind and you've got to learn to flow in the Holy Ghost. Walk and live in the spirit. Are you getting some help this morning? All right, Luke 4. I just thought, let's, let's look at an example of this. And the Lord gave us this over the, the weekend or the fast, but it's, it's so significant and encouraging. Luke 4, verse 1 to 2. Now, you know the, the, the part of Jesus' journey this is. He hasn't yet stepped into his ministry. He's just been baptized by uh, John the Baptist in the wilderness. He's been in the wilderness. He's been baptized in water, and the Holy Spirit comes on and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Look at verse one. Then Jesus, being filled, say filled, with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led, say led, by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. Please notice the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Say filled. Being filled with the Holy Spirit enables me to be led by the Holy Spirit. You see, some of us struggling to be led by the Holy Spirit because we're not being filled by the Spirit. And how do we get filled by the Spirit? We get filled by the Spirit by spending time in God's presence, coming to church, being connected to the life of, of God's church, being connected to our quiet time, spending time in the Word, spending time in fellowship with God, spending time in fellowship with other believers. Right, filled with the Spirit. Now look, not only was he filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was led by the Holy Spirit. If we're going to step into the new things, if we're going to see the the, the natural things come out, then we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and enable us. Now here's the the not so enjoyable part in the natural. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will be led by the Spirit, but you might be led through the wilderness. Look at the person next to say, oh gee, are you serious? But here's what I want you to write down. You don't have to be afraid of your wilderness. Because when you've got the Holy Spirit in you, listen, Jesus was not nervous of going into the wilderness. Why? He read his Bible. He knew what Isaiah said. He said, oh, I'm being led into the wilderness. My God makes a way in the wilderness. 
My God creates rivers in the desert. And how did he deal with the enemy? You see, when you get filled with the Spirit and you're led by the Spirit, you think your life's going to be comfortable, easy, no pressure. No, it's going to get more difficult, more challenging. There'll be more opportunities to fail. There'll be more challenges that come. But here's the good news this morning. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You are equal to the task. You're able to come through your wilderness the same way Jesus did. He said, Satan, it is written. But look what happens. Look what happens when Jesus, through that time of fasting, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, it says in verse 14, then he returned in the power of the Spirit. So you've got to be filled with the Spirit. You've got to be led by the Spirit. And in that process, as you go through the wilderness, God will transform you and you'll start operating in the power of the Spirit. And what will the power do? The power will start to not just transform you inwardly, but it will transform things outwardly. It's the power of God, the dunamis of God, that will heal the sick, raise the dead, turn your mountain into a molehill. So let's understand this morning, as we walk in grace, let's not limit the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. This is what the Lord showed me this week. It was so encouraging. He said to me, Larry, how much water do you want? What is water a reference to? The Holy Spirit. How, how much water do you want? God gave Ezekiel the vision. First the water was ankle deep. Then it was knee deep. Then it was waist deep. Then they couldn't even stand in the river. What is he referring to? How much of the Holy Spirit do you want? When it comes to the Holy Spirit, are you going to say, no, Holy Spirit, don't worry, I don't need any more of you? Come on. And how you know the reality is, how many of you are going to say, listen, no more water, Lord, I don't need more water anymore? No, because you need water every day. I love, I love what's happened today. You know, the, the, the praise and worship, just every song was flowing with a theme. The, the communion was flowing with a theme. Why? Because God wants you to know today, he loves you so much. He loves you so much that he is going to do a new thing. And water represents life. Water represents sustenance. Water represents prosperity and success in the natural. But in the spirit, it represents the Holy Spirit who is your life, who is your victory. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip. Mm, That is good. Anyone want some water? Anyone? You want some water? No, I can give you some. (laughs) Sorry, I just couldn't resist that. It felt so good. We never want to say, Lord, I don't need more water. Never want to say, Lord, I don't need more Holy Spirit in my life. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just listen. We, we, we complicate it and, 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 and people have tried to make it what it's not because the enemy wants to undermine and play it down bap- The baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply an expression of the overflowing and infilling and replenishing of the Spirit in your life so that you can have sustenance and balance and victory. Notice the distinction between being filled with the Holy Spirit and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Something happened to Jesus in that wilderness that transformed him from not just being a Spirit-filled man to being a power-filled man. In John 4, verse 13 and 14, another example, just quickly. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But that water I shall give him will become in him, listen carefully to the terminology, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. We know what he's speaking about. This is the story of the lady at the the well. We don't have time today to go and look at that story, but go look at that story. It is incredible because Jesus interacts with a woman who, firstly, he shouldn't be speaking to women. Secondly, she was a Samaritan woman. Thirdly, he shouldn't have even been in that Samaritan village because the Jews would take the shortcut. They didn't like going through Samaria. It was firstly the long way around. Secondly, they didn't like interacting with Samaritans because they didn't get on. But he deliberately goes that way, and then he encounters this woman whose life's a mess. 
say a mess. How many know sometimes our lives are a mess? I don't know about you, but my life was a mess, and sometimes it's still a mess, and yet Jesus never gives up on us. And he encounters this woman, and he's not just there for the woman, because this woman goes back, and, he, and she lets the whole village know, the whole town, this incredible Savior that she's met. And then they come out, and they have this experience. And you know what? One of them make a statement. They say, now we believe, not because of your word, but because we've experienced for ourselves that he is the son of the living God. You see, being filled with the Spirit positions us to be moving in the power of the Spirit and causing us to fulfill the call that Christ has placed on our lives. Therefore, we must be connected to the Spirit in all aspects of our lives and submit to the leading and to the discipline of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't understand that in, in this grace thing today, we, we get confused about discipline and, and doing the right thing, and, and we get it confused. The grace of God doesn't enable you to live an undisciplined life. It empowers you to live a disciplined life. So the things you couldn't do, the things you couldn't stay away from, you now can because the Spirit of God has empowered you. Now you're moving in the Spirit. So just in the last few minutes that I have, I want to talk to you this morning just about the seven rivers of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how they relate to us and how we should relate to them. I don't have time to teach in depth, so I'm going to just throw it out there this morning and you take a hold of what's for you and, and let it encourage you and then you can go study it. The seven rivers or flows of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Number one, the Holy Spirit is our regenerator. He's our regenerator. John 3 verse 5 says, Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless you are born of water and born of the Spirit, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. The, 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 word, the word to regenerate means to bring new and more or to bring to vigorous life. So at salvation, we meet the Holy Spirit who can do everything. He is the spirit of the living God. He has limitless power, wisdom, and he's willing to live inside of you if you'll believe in Jesus. He is the means that we have access to God's amazing power. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, don't marvel that I said, you must be born again. It's the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, it's the Holy Spirit who's hovering. Every time we preach the word, every time the word is used, the Holy Spirit's there and he's hovering. You know, like a drone. I, I thought of having a drone here this morning and just having it lift off and hover over my head. And then I thought, well, if the person doesn't like me. That could get really complicated. But, but that Holy Spirit's hovering there like a drone, hovering, hovering, hovering. And when you say, I believe, boom, he comes inside and he regenerates you brings you to vigorous new life. Let's not limit or minimize the Holy Spirit's power to transform a sinner and deliver a saint. Number two, the second river, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is your empowerer. He empowers you or enables you to do things that you could never do before. Luke 4, 24 verse 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. Wherever the Spirit of God is, He changes people into on-fire radicals for Christ. If you're here this morning, you're like, these guys are radical, they, their praise is loud, their dance is boisterous, their, their, their lives are loud, and, and who's this pastor, he's crazy, he marches up and down like a soldier, yeah, we are crazy, we are crazy about Jesus, we are radical for the kingdom, we are so glad that Jesus saved us. And it's not because we're anything, it's because greater is he. That is in us. He gives the power for you and I to preach boldly, to heal the sick, to share the testimony of God's uh, love in our lives. And through him, we have access into the realms of God and the ability of God in every area of our lives. Don't limit God in your marriage, in your business, in the life of your children. I mean, he will do amazing things. And those rivers will literally start to transcend and change the things. I love what one preacher said. He said, uh, this is the year of 18. And the year of 18 means we don't only need the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we need the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit because nine and nine equals 18. You see, in times past, we focused on the nine gifts and that's amazing. 
And then in other times we focused on the nine fruit, but we need them both. Can you say amen? Because they're both a manifestation of God's incredible love and power in the life of the believer. Romans 8, 11 says, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Woo! Number three. The third river of the Holy Spirit this morning as a believer, the Holy Spirit is your guide. He's your guide. He'll tell you, tell you where to go, when to go, and how to go. He'll also tell you where not to go and how not to be there and the right time to not be there. You see, sometimes we focus on the things that happen. What we don't know is the things we missed out on because of our obedience. The evil that God protected us from because we listened to the promptings of his Holy Spirit in our lives. I hope one day he shows us a movie. And he says, Larry, yeah, here's where you missed a car accident. Larry, here's where you missed meeting the wrong person. Larry, here's where you missed out on this and that because you are walking in the spirit and listening to the leadership and prompting. 1 John 2 verse 27 says, but the anointing which you have received from him lives in you and you do not need anyone to teach you. That's not a statement of arrogance. You know, I don't need to be teachable. No, he's saying that you know whatever you need to know for your life if you'll learn to tap in to the resources of the spirit. But as that same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as he has taught, you will live in him. The Holy Spirit this morning has access to all the wisdom and knowledge of God, and he will impart that into our lives. When we live in him, he'll lead us, he'll help us mature, he'll help us grow, and he'll help us be who we need to be because he's our teacher. We can depend on him. He will give us the heavenly directions we need. He is like the Siri of the iPhone. He is like the GPS of Garmin, except he doesn't make a mistake. I mean, the one, uh, one uh, Pastor Matthew was sharing whether he was on Google Maps and it led him to a road that wasn't a road that eventually became a felt. Hey, you know, Google will make mistakes, but Jesus never makes mistakes. Amen. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I'm not preaching anything new this morning, but I'm encouraging you to tap in to the resources you do have. The Holy Spirit will lead you. He will guide you. Listen, he has the information from your past, your present, and he knows where you need to be in the future. <laughs> I don't want to go over my time, so I'm just going to say this. Our phone might have Siri, but we have the Holy Spirit. And he is like Siri on steroids times a million. Amen? Amen? He's your internal guidance system. And as you learn to listen to his subtle nudgings, he will lead you into victory. If we had time today, I can share testimonies in my life of how the Holy Spirit's led us to things, situations, places, venues, people, things that released us into the next level of ministry, of, of, of interaction, of resources, of prosperity, of success. That same company I worked with, Roger, as a, as a sales rep, I'm not, I'm not a kind of a salesperson person. I know you might struggle to think that, believe that, but it's true. It's not my, I'm actually an introvert. No, I am. It's when the Holy Spirit comes on me. I really do this under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But, but I was working for this company as a sales rep, and, and they gave me an area that was terrible. And I was a young Christian. I didn't know better. Thank goodness. I just said, that's fine. Give me any area because God is on my side. And I went into this area, and I was going home one day, and I was, I was, I'd had a busy day. I had no leads, no success. And, you know, if you know the medical profession, if you're going to see a doctor, you normally make an appointment months in advance. I'm driving home. It was past uh, closed time, and I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to stop at these medical rooms. I thought, this is crazy. I drove past, but that nudging wouldn't go. So I turned and went back, and I went in, and I looked at, oh, Dr. Doms. Oh, he's a physician. Oh, yeah. And I thought, okay, I'll take down his name and I'll, I'll phone him and I'll make an appointment. And the Holy Spirit said, no, go up to his rooms. I'm like, but it's late, I want to go home. But that prompting was there. I went upstairs, I spoke to the receptionist. I said, could I please have, I didn't even know what to say, Dr. Dom's number, I want to make an appointment. She says, well, what do you do? I'm a rep. Hmm. She says, okay, what do you sell? And I told you, she says, that's amazing. 
Dr. Doms was speaking about that today. He wants to see a rep about this medical equipment you sell. I'm like, really? He says, yeah, actually he's here. Let me ask him. She went in. She came out. She said, fine, you can see him now. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That afternoon, I signed a deal, and that man knew every physician in that bad area, and he told everyone about me, the deals I was giving, and how awesome uh, rep I was, which I wasn't, and how, you know, I sold that whole area flat. I came out looking like the most incredible salesperson in the world. My boss wanted to give me a raise and an increase. I said, you're welcome. You, you can go ahead and do that. But it wasn't me, because the Holy Spirit will make you look good if you learn to listen to him. Equally, and I don't want to tell you these stories, there are times where I haven't listened. And I've got a whole lot of mud on my face. I'm like, Lord, why? And the Lord said, no, you didn't follow the promptings and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Number four. Are you getting some help this morning? Okay, we're nearly done. The Holy Spirit is our unifier. The Holy Spirit is our unifier. He's the one that brings you and I into unity. In Acts 2, verse 46 and 47, it says they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. You see, listen, the, the thing that keeps a local church together is not the incredible personalities, the wonderful pastor and the awesome leadership. It's the Holy Spirit working in our hearts keeping us in unity, giving us a love for each other that commonly we wouldn't have for each other. But now because we're in God and we've got the Holy Spirit in us, there's a common connection that causes me to look past your ugliness. I mean, not, not in this church, the Pastor Matt Christian's church. They've got a lot of ugly people. In this church, we've only got good people. No, you, you're ugly like I'm ugly sometimes. But the... The Holy Spirit causes you to look past that. He causes you, causes you and I and gives us the ability to love beyond our ability. Why? Because the Holy Spirit brings us into unity with the Father and with the Son and with each other. It's the Greek word, if you go study it in Acts 2, it's the Greek word koinonia. And it's used for the first time here in Acts 2. And then from then on, it's used more than 18 times in the New Testament. And if you look at that word in the Greek, it actually speaks about partnership. It speaks about an uncommon love for each other that, that causes us to want other people's better. Other people's betterment. Number five, the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. Wow. What did I say wrong? Hey? That's an English word from the Larry Dictionary, all right? So don't give me a hard time. <laughs> You're the only one who heard me say it wrong. Oh, and a few other English people around. Okay. It's okay. Walk in love. The Holy Spirit will help you. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is one of the greatest miracles of grace, that the Apostle Paul is telling us that the Holy Spirit will help us to pray when we don't know what to pray for. Have you ever been in a situation and you just don't know what to pray for? Or how about this? You just feel like you can't pray because you're so overwhelmed by your situation and all you can do is say, God, help me. David understood that. He prayed that prayer all the time. And in the New Testament, we have the privilege of having the Holy Spirit who comes alongside us to help us to pray when we don't know what to pray for. And we can just begin to groan in the Spirit and just cry out to God and just, just be pure before God. And you know what? The Holy Spirit will turn those prayers into a, into a language that God understands and knows because He knows your heart and He'll empower you to pray the perfect will of God. Oh man, we could tap into this. Uh, when I pray for my wife, I don't try and limit myself by praying in English. <laughs> I mean... She is a complicated being, created in all the intricacies of God. I mean, God created her so amazing, he sometimes doesn't even understand her. 
But he said, it's okay, Larry, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will help you to groan in the Spirit for Mandy. <laughs> That's why heavenly language is so beautiful because, you know, when you pray, you'll pray in your limited ability, you'll pray what you want for your wife. But if you'll pray in the Spirit, you'll pray what God wants. And God knows not only what she needs, she also know, he also knows what I need. So when you pray an unselfish prayer like that, God is able to take that prayer and make it exactly what it needs to be for that person you're praying for. All right, number six. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. John 14, verse 16 to 18 says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. That's the word parakletos, comforter, that he might abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Listen to this next statement. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. Now, when we talk about comforter, we're not talking about someone that comes alongside you and pats you on the back and says, oh, I feel so sorry for you with you. The Holy Spirit won't join your pity party. But he will help you have a praise party. And lift you out of your situation and come alongside you and encourage you and say, no, no, I know it's difficult now, but you can do this. You can get through what you're going through. The only way I dealt with my wife, my late wife's death and went through the, the trauma and the pain of that grief, the only way I got through that and making sense and keeping my faith was by the help of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there were people, and I appreciate the people that the Holy Spirit put there that could say the right things at the right time, but the comfort of the Holy Spirit is the most incredible experience any of us can have. Stop limiting God in your life. Stop holding on to your past. Stop holding on to the pain. Let the Holy Spirit into that area of your life and let him come and comfort you and strengthen you and clean you out, which is my last one, number seven. Man, if we had more time, we could dig into these a bit, but you go study them and the Lord, the Lord will show you. Number seven, the Holy Spirit is your refiner. How you know, fire refines things. When the Spirit came upon the 120, in the disciple, uh, on the 120 disciples in the upper room, he manifested himself in two primary ways. Number one, he came as a rushing mighty wind. And then he came as fly, f flames of fire that miraculously sat on each one of the heads. Now, we know it wasn't literal fire because it would have burnt them. But it was a spiritual fire which speaks about the fact that the Holy Spirit comes and he purifies us. He burns out all the rubbish out of our lives and he purifies us and he helps us to address the things in our lives that don't please God, that will cause us to remain in a place of unholiness and prevent the fire and the life and the ministry of God to go forth in our lives. It's a visual manifestation of God's presence and holiness that empowers you and I to move forward in our spiritual growth and spiritual depth that helps us to be empowered. I'll close with this scripture this morning, John 3, verse 1 to 4. Uh, Pastor Matt used it last week, but it jumped out at me. And I just want to read verse 1 says that Joshua rose early in the morning, set out from Acacia Grove, came to the Jordan. He and the children of Israel lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went to the camp and commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, verse 3, and the priests, Levites, bearing it, and you shall set out from your place and go after it, verse 4. Yet there shall be a space, say space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits of measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way, say the way, by which you must go, because you have not passed by this way before. That is an example to you and I, when it, when it speaks about keeping distance, he's not saying we must keep our distance from God, because God has removed the veil. We can go right into the Holy of Holies. This is what it's saying to you. It's an example of the importance, if we want to have these seven rivers flowing through our lives of the Holy Spirit, that we need to respect, cherish, value, and esteem the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I pass to you this morning? Can I ask you this morning? This year, let's respect the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's value it above everything else. Let's cherish it. Let's esteem it. Let's welcome it into our midst. Because that's what God was saying to Joshua and the people. Don't take it for granted, the power that God has placed in your life.
every head bowed, every eye closed. As we reflect this morning on God's word to us today as a church, the rivers of living water, the rivers in the desert, God is going to do an amazing thing in your life this year. Let's allow him to do it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit who empowers us and prepares us to pursue the life that you've created for us. Thank you that you're ready to help us to not be held captive by fear, by our past or by anything, and that you'll help us to walk in the way that God has planned for our lives. Thank you that we'll give you all the glory. We ask that you'll supply your grace like a river in the desert and strength to pursue all that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Would you just lift your hands and just say, I receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God into my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're merciful and gracious. Right now, while every head is bowed, every eyes closed, no one looking around, if you're here today and you never personally accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never accepted the free gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, you can leave here today knowing that you're born again and that the Holy Spirit has come into your life and regenerated you. If that's you this morning, wherever you're sitting, and you say, Pastor, would you include me in that prayer? I want to accept Christ as my Savior. Right now on the count of three, if you'll just raise your hand. One, two, three. Just raise it up high. God bless you over there. God bless you over there. Is there someone else this morning? Thank you, Lord, for your living word. Once you put up your hand, you can put it down. I'm now going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of salvation. I'm going to ask the whole church to just pray this aloud with us so that we can encourage your faith. Let's pray together. Say, Father God, I believe today that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died on the cross of Calvary for me. I receive him as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you for saving me today. I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are now born again. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus and you are a brand new creation. In just a moment, we're going to show you how you can take that next step. But before we do that, we're going to.